You're watching Saturday Anime on the Sci-Fi Channel. Greetings, this is Reverend Paul, and this, of course, is Studio Chojin Ra. You should know this already. And if you clicked on this video, you probably already know that today we're going to be talking about Wicked City. So let's just get right to it. So, Wicked City is a 1987 anime that is based off of a book that was written by Hideyuki Kikuchi. And it's also worth mentioning that Wicked City is directed by Yoshiaki Kawajiri. So, Wicked City is the first collaboration between Kawajiri and Kikuchi. And the the two of them would go on to collaborate several times in the future, most notably with Demon City Shinjuku and of course Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust. Now Wicked City is a movie I grew up with. This is a movie that, you know, it's one of the first animes I've seen and this was always one of the, like the definitive titles that you would always show to your friends. Back in the 90s when you would try to get your friends into anime, you'd be like, you got to see some of the crazy shit that happens in these Japanese animations. And Wicked City was always one of those films you would take off your shelf and put in the VCR to show your your buddies how crazy anime could be. So Wicked City is about a character named Taki, who is a mild-mannered businessman during the day, but at night he is a black guard. And what a black guard is, is a person who protects the human world from demonic terrorists. Because you see, in the world of Wicked City, there are two worlds. There is the human world, and then there is the demon world, also known as the black world. And there are demonic terrorists that seek to invade the human world because there is an uneasy alliance between the human world and the demon world. In fact, there is a peace treaty between the two worlds, and that peace treaty has to be renewed every couple hundred years. The story of Wicked City starts with Taki going to the airport and meeting his new partner. His new partner, of course, is Makie, and Taki and Makie are tasked with protecting Giuseppe Maillard, who is a 100-year-old psychic, and he is there to sign a new peace treaty between the human world and the black world. And things are not that easy because you see there is a group of demonic terrorists who want to stop this peace treaty from being signed. They do not want peace between the two worlds. And that is the conflict at the basis of Wicked City. The two blackguards trying to protect Giuseppe Maillard from the demons. The first thing that's worth noting about Wicked City is that Wicked City is Kawajiri's follow-up to The Running Man, which was the short he made for Neo Tokyo. And Wicked City is pretty much Kawajiri's first stab at directing a feature film. And it establishes who Yoshiaki Kawajiri is as an action director. All his trademarks come from this movie. The strobing effect, the zooming in, the fade in and fade out. I don't know how to explain it, but that like a character slashes and there's this like fade in and fade out. Everything we need to know about Kawajiri comes from this movie. In fact, in a lot of ways, Wicked City is almost like the template for Ninja Scroll. And Makie, Taki, and Maiart serve as the prototypes for Jubei Kagera and Dockling. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that Wicked City was originally supposed to be a half an hour OVA, but the producers were so impressed with the work Kawajiri was doing, they asked him if they could make the movie 90 minutes. In the original version of Wicked City, the story began at the airport, so the entire opening of the movie was added. So is the ending and some bits in the middle, but they are working from that same script that was a half an hour long, so the story itself is kind of thin, but that is not a problem with Wicked City because you see the thing that makes Wicked City interesting and what makes Wicked City so great is it is the quintessential erotic horror and the way the movie opens is the perfect gateway into the world of Wicked City. The movie starts off with Taki on a date with a girl that he's been wanting to go out with for a while and then you know the two of them hit it off and then they go back to her apartment and then they start to get it on. Now preceding the sex sequence there are all these little hints that something is not right. We see a woman's hand laying on the floor of the bathroom. As they're fucking in the bed, there's a shot of a dead bird. So from the very start of the film, the movie is juxtaposing sexual imagery with elements of horror. Then when the sex scene reaches its climax, pun completely intended, when the sex scene reaches its climax, it is revealed that the woman Taki is having sex with is actually a woman from the black world. And she turns into a spider woman and she has a fucking vagina with teeth. It is the fucking freakiest thing you have ever seen in your life. 
But this sequence serves as the perfect gateway into this world, and it's executed so masterfully by Kawajiri. And one thing that kind of stands out to me is that even though there's a lot of sexuality in the film, and even though there's a lot of violence in the film, it is a very restrained movie. It's interesting too because Orosuke Doji also came out in 1987, and Orosuke Doji covers a lot of the same ground as Wicked City. But the approaches the two films have to the material are very, very different, which is why I would describe Wicked City as an erotic horror, because Kawajiri is implying the sexuality and he is implying the violence. Rewatching this movie now, I was actually surprised how tame it was. I remembered the sex and the violence being a lot more graphic, and it's actually sort of very restrained. I mean, I can't think of another word to describe it. Wicked City really demonstrates what an expert stylist Kawajiri really is, because the way he frames his sex sequences is very artful. And I think this is apparent in the opening sequence with the Spider Woman, and it's reinforced later on in the film when Makie is kidnapped by the henchmen of Mr. Shadow. When Makie is kidnapped, Taki is presented with these images of Makie being raped by Mr. Shadow's henchmen. And the way Kawajiri depicts the rape sequence, he very deliberately picks these very artful shots where there are close-ups of Makie's mouth and close-ups of her legs. And he takes this sequence that could be horrific, and it is horrific, I mean, considering what they're doing to her, but the way Kawajiri is presenting it, he is presenting it in this very sensual manner. He is portraying it as erotica. It becomes kind of clear that Wicked City is not really a hentai. It's much more in line with something like Belladonna of Sadness, where it is not overly graphic with the sexuality, but it's very artful in the way it presents its sexuality. One sequence that I think is really interesting is the sequence where Taki is being absorbed by the woman with a vagina on her stomach. Yes, there totally is a woman in this movie who has a vagina on her stomach. It's one of the awesome things about this movie. It's so crazy and it incorporates all these surrealistic images and it makes the visual style of the film feel very unique. But I digress. When the woman from the black world is absorbing Taki into her body, the style of the film switches and it becomes very minimalistic. And in fact, the movie starts to look a lot like Belladonna sadness. I mean, you look at this shot and this looks like something you could have directly pulled out of Belladonna of Sadness. And I think this sequence in particular makes it very clear that Wicked City is an extension of the kind of seductive horror that was pioneered by a movie like Belladonna of Sadness. Now, I mentioned before that the plot of the movie is kind of thin. And once again, I don't see that as a problem because Wicked City in a lot of ways is almost like Kawajiri's version of Blade Runner in the sense that it is not a movie about exposition, it is a movie about atmosphere. And we could see this certainly in the way the film is presented, where one thing that's worth noting is that there's a lot of silence in the movie. There's a lot of ambience. The score cuts out and you're just hearing the sounds of the city. You're hearing footsteps and ambient noise in the background. And it is really painting the feeling of what it means to be living within this city that is occupied by all these demonic forces. I feel like if there was more more exposition in this film, it would change the tone of the film. It would become a completely different movie. What makes this movie work is the fact that it is a movie that is emphasizing style and mood and atmosphere. I think one of the scenes where this is really apparent is the airport sequence, which is a great sequence. There's a lot of great atmosphere. The use of color in this sequence is incredible. The use of blue and red, the use of ambient sounds and the very minimalist use of score makes this sequence very powerful. And this is one of the iconic scenes of Wicked City. This is one of those sequences that they always show clips of. And I think the transformation sequences are really great too. One thing I really love about the transformation sequences is that when the characters transform, they have these demonic qualities but still retain certain elements of their human body. It makes them look that much more horrific and surrealistic. And another thing I like is this character here with the fucking head with the spider legs and the eyes on the stalks. This totally has to be a reference to the thing, <laughs> which I think is really cool. One thing that struck me upon my rewatch of Wicked City is that I think Wicked City is a metaphor for like a whirlwind love affair. Like going out on a blind date and meeting the girl of your dreams and falling in love. This is what I think this movie is about because the movie begins with Taki as this kind of bachelor, living the bachelor life, hooking up with random chicks. And then he meets Makie. And then they have this crazy night out on the town. It's almost like a date. I mean, one thing that's really interesting about Wicked City is that it's almost 
almost like a series of vignettes where the characters are always driving to the next location. Each action sequence is always introduced by the characters driving to a new place. So it does kind of feel like this crazy first date. And another thing that really stood out to me was the fact that Makie's ex-boyfriend shows up and kind of tries to seduce Makie and Taki fucking kills him. <laughs> it's like, it's like, wow, like this show is really kind of driving home this element of like these two people finding each other and casting off their baggage and sort of starting this new love affair. Even the spider woman serves as a temptress for Taki. This seductive, dangerous woman who's trying to like lure him away from finding true love. And the spider woman serves as this metaphor for temptation and a cautionary tale about hooking up with dangerous women. Because you never know. You might meet a chick at a bar and she may have a vagina with teeth. <laughs> <laughs> what we learn at the end of the film is that Taki and Makie aren't protecting my art. My art is actually protecting them because Taki and Makie, their DNA is compatible and they could have a child, a child that could unite the two worlds. And once again, when you look at it in the context of the film being this metaphor for this whirlwind love affair, my art serves as kind of a father figure, bringing these two characters together. I think this point is really made clear later on in the film when Makie changes out of her suit and then puts on this white dress. She puts on this white dress and then later on in the film, Taki and Makie consummate their relationship in a church. <laughs> so, I mean, when you look at it in that regard, Wicked City is this very obvious metaphor for two people falling in love, getting married, and starting a family together. It's a really interesting thing that I never really picked up on until I rewatched it for this review. Now, even though there isn't a lot of characterization in Wicked City, I do think the characters are very likable. I think Taki is a very cool, smooth dude. Makie is a very sexy, badass character. But really, I think the character that steals the show is Giuseppe Maillard. Giuseppe Maillard is this fucking horny, perverted old dude, and he is the most relatable character in Wicked City. At least he is to me, because this is the thing. Giuseppe Maillard is doing the things that I think everybody wants to do. He is in fucking 1980s Tokyo, which is like the most awesome place in the world. And all he wants to do is he wants to go to the soap lands, he wants to go to the strip clubs, he wants to go to the bars, he wants to experience the exotic nightlife that is 1980s Tokyo. And who cannot relate to that? We would all love to do that. I mean, it does suck that he goes to a soap land and then hooks up with a chick and she ends up absorbing him into her body. That really does suck. He does get some boob action, although he swallows a parasite. That sucked. But all in all, he was doing his best to try to have a good time. So Giuseppe Maillard, definitely an awesome character. We should all be so lucky to live vicariously through him. In closing, I really think Wicked City is a classic anime film to come out of the 1980s. And really, it's probably a classic of the genre itself because it encapsulates the style that would come to define not only Yoshiaki Kawajiri's work, but in a lot of ways, other erotic horrors and even other hentais. It's a really great movie and I think everybody should go and check it out. Definitely if you're a fan of Kawajiri and definitely if you're a fan of erotic horror. This week's question comes from Dark Knight Fan 75, who writes, Hey Paul, now that the Snyder Cut of Justice League has come out, what did you think of it? And if Zack were to have the chance to revive his original insane ideas for Justice League Part 2 and 3, would you want to see that? Also, what's your point of view on the controversy surrounding Zack? People who say it's the same as the 2017 version of the film, but longer, just sound petty, and they're just saying that stuff for the sake of hating on him, just because they don't like him and his movies. A very basic question I know, but I love the movie and wanted to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Dark Knight fan, for sending in a question. I've mentioned before that I didn't hate the 2017 version of Justice League. I thought as a live action version of the Super Friends TV show, it was perfectly enjoyable. But with that said, I do have to say that Zack Snyder's Justice League is a huge improvement over Justice League 2017. I enjoyed most of it, and I'm not a fan of Zack Snyder's DCEU. I think Zack Snyder is a pretty cool dude. I've seen interviews with him and he comes off as very genuine and very sincere. And I have a lot of sympathy for him with all the personal tragedy he's had to endure. And I like Zack Snyder as a filmmaker. I'm probably the only person who likes Sucker Punch. But with that said, I have 
never been a fan of Zack Snyder's version of the DCEU. Because it seems like to me, he doesn't really like Batman or Superman. He just kind of wants to reinvent them as his own dark versions of the character. One thing I will say about Justice League 2017 is that that film attempted to give Superman a personality. <laughs> Zack Snyder's Superman has no personality. Superman in Zack Snyder movies is a guy who just kind of stands there with his hands at his side with this blank expression on his face staring at shit. He's either doing that or he's Homelander from The Boys burning people with his heat vision. And that was one of my problems with the new movie is that Superman is hardly in it. He just kind of shows up at the end and doesn't really have a lot to do. But overall as a piece, I did enjoy Zack Snyder's Justice League. It's not a completely different movie from the 2017 version. The 2017 version is almost like the cliff notes of the movie and Zack Snyder's cut is almost like the unabridged novel. I do feel like the 2017 version does capture the broad strokes of the film. It just loses a lot of the detail. So people who say it's just the same movie, but longer, I think that's inaccurate. A lot of the details improve the movie. The Flash had a lot more characterization and Cyborg had a big role in this movie. I mean, I thought Cyborg was really cool in this film. I do feel like time did help the Snyder cut. The reason the first Avengers movie worked is because they set up all the characters in individual movies first, and then we got to see them all in a movie together. And the problem with the original Justice League movie was the fact that it was just randomly introducing these characters, and we didn't know who they were. It was introducing Aquaman and The Flash and Cyborg. But now, since there's been an Aquaman movie, and we saw the previous version of the Justice League movie, we're familiar with these characters. So they're characters that we already feel like we know. So in a weird way, this this movie has that Avengers effect where you're watching characters you've previously known interact with each other and a lot of that was really cool to see. Now like I said, I enjoyed this movie overall, but that ending sequence, the nightmare sequence, I thought that was fucking awful. <laughs> that I thought that was terrible. And that's what Zack Snyder wants to do. Like this is Zack Snyder's whole reason for making Man of Steel, Batman versus Superman and the Justice League is just so he could make a movie where Batman has a trench coat and he's wandering through the post apocalypse and Superman is a murderous psychopath. Everything he's doing is just to get to that point. And I fucking hated it. I thought that sequence had some of the worst dialogue ever. It was really fucking terrible. And honestly, the thought of watching a three hour movie of Batman and Joker wandering through the post apocalypse sounds fucking awful. <laughs> Like, I have no interest in seeing this. It really does boil down to the core of why I feel like Zack Snyder was the wrong guy to direct these movies, because that is the movie he wants to make, is the crazy version of the Justice League that has nothing to do with the Justice League, where it's just going to be Batman and the Joker in a fucking dune buggy driving through the post-apocalypse. Like, that just sounds terrible to me. <laughs> it's like, we haven't even had a good Superman movie since Superman 2. You can't reinvent Superman as Homelander before we get get a good Superman movie. Just make a good Superman movie that captures who Superman is as a character. I just want one good Superman movie where he smiles and he saves people and he's charming. Just make one movie. Then you could reinvent Superman into a murderous psychopath. Once again, I like Zack Snyder as a dude. I like his films, but... <sighs> I don't like his DC movies, and I don't think I'd really be interested in seeing any more Zack Snyder <laughs> Justice League movies. But thank you, Dark Knight fan, for sending in the question. I'm glad you enjoyed the movie. Overall, it was a good movie. I did like it, but that ending sequence to me was just awful. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. If you have a question or a comment or you want to complain about something, feel free to send me an email at studiochojin at gmail.com. Make the subject raw. and. I I will be happy to read it and answer it on a future edition of this show. So this wraps up this week's edition of Studio Trojan Raw. I hope you enjoyed the video and I want to urge you to join the Unholy Army of the Night and subscribe to the channel. If you'd like to support the channel, you could always hit the like button. You could leave a comment. I'm also an independent artist. I'm an independent content creator. I will be self-publishing a comic book in a couple of months. And if you'd like to support an independent artist, an independent content creator like myself, I have a coffee account that you could feel free to donate or you could always just watch Watch the videos and send positive vibes. Any kind of support you choose to do is greatly appreciated. So, once again, this is Reverend Paul saying, until we meet again.